Morning, everyone. Everyone have a good night last night. So today, uh, we're going to talk about PHP under the hood. Um, I am Davy Shafik, as you probably know from the schedule. Uh, what that means is I'm a community engineer at Engine Yard. We are a platform as a service. We put your PHP applications in the cloud and scale them. That's all my plugs for today. Well, not really. Uh, I'm the author of the Zen PHP 5 Certification Study Guide and two other books. I'm a contributor to Zen Framework 1 and 2, PHP Docs, Frappy, PHP Internals. Uh, I am the originator of the FAR uh, PHP Archives idea. Uh, and I'm at dshafik on Twitter. So if you have any feedback, um, <clears throat> please tweet me after. Um, if you're interested in getting a purple elephant and supporting PHP Women, phpwomen.org slash elephant. Uh, we have a Kickstarter, so go ahead and get that. Uh, one, well, two more things, actually. Um, <clears throat> first of all, these are my slides from Benelux, because I tried to retheme this morning, it didn't work. So uh, normally I put a slide in about my accents, because I kind of switch back and forth between my British and my American, and I can't control it. So apologies. Um, and I'm hard of hearing. So if you have any questions, I may actually come out and talk to you. So <clears throat> my slides are a little bit different to a lot of people's. Um, I have a title slide like this, and then behind it I have bullet points, because I have two problems with other speakers. Uh, one is when they have the bullet points up and it acts as subtitles, which as a deaf person can be kind of nice, but I read faster than they talk and it gets annoying. Uh, and the other problem is when uh, I hear about a good talk and I go online to look at the slides and it's 18 pictures of cats. Um, so I'll have a slide like this behind it that you can go online and read later that I'll be skipping. So <clears throat> originally this talk was called PHP Performance Under the Hood and I retitled it after uh, Benelux because there's not much performance stuff in it. But I want to tell you how I got here. So I want to talk about profiling. So what is profiling? Um, so, and really what's the difference between benchmarking and profiling? So profiling is measuring the relative speed of different portions of your application not the actual speed. Benchmarking is testing actual speed because profiling modifies the speed of your application. So profiling is trying to identify bottlenecks, but you can't actually tell if you fixed a problem with profiling. You have to benchmark again. So we get into what I call the performance loop, which looks like this. You benchmark to see if what your current performance is. You profile to see where your bottlenecks are. You fix stuff, and then you benchmark again. You don't profile again to see if it's actually worked. When should you profile your code? Um, so the number one issue that I see people having with performance tuning is kind of assuming that you have a problem. Um, premature optimization is a huge waste of time, and I see it happen time and time again. So the first thing you need to do is determine what your desired performance should be. So I need 100 concurrent connections with sub-second response times. Run your benchmark on production hardware to see if you have a problem, and only then should you be profiling and actually uh, seeing how big your problem is. There are a number of common causes for slowdowns, data stores, external resources, and then the most unusual one is bad code, and that's why I got here. Uh, and I have a quote here. The only great code is code that never has to run. Everything else is just good code. <clears throat> so basically, if you got here, you're in trouble. If you're at the point where you're looking at your opcodes, you're kind of screwed, but it's interesting to know. So internals 101. Uh, I know there's at least two internals developers here. Any others? Actually, there's three, which is good. If you have questions later, I'll point them at them. Um, so the execution lifecycle of PHP is what it looks like. When you execute a PHP script, it goes into the PHP interpreter, the binary. It passes it into tokens, compiles those into opcodes, then sends them through the uh, Zend engine, which is a virtual machine, and we get our output. And it's remarkably similar to the Java execution engine. So people call PHP an interpreted language, it's not compiled. But it actually is, it just happens every time, right? So with Java, what happens is we pass, we turn it into bytecode, which is their version of opcodes, and then we save it. And then we run it through the VM time and time again. So it's quite similar to when you include an opcache. With this one, um, we execute, we check the opcache. If it's there, we just run it from shared memory. So it's kind of like saving it to a binary file and executing it time and time again. Otherwise, we pass it, compile it, save it, and then run it. Today, we're going to look at this bit. Um, the compiling, actually, we're going to look at tokens as well, but compiling to opcodes and the execution. 
So the first thing that happens is tokenizing. And we're going to look at this, which is the worst hello world ever. Um, if you could over-engineer a hello world, this would be it. Um, so we have a class greeting with a function, say hello, takes one variable, and we echo out hello to. And then we call it, we instantiate the object, and we pass in some information. What this looks like when we tokenize it is this. Um, this came from, when I was writing this uh, talk, I uh, was getting the tokens out of PHP, and I was like writing command line sort of dash R type code. And uh, I accidentally typed tokenize in the name of the script, and it worked, and threw out a wonderful table of information. I went, where the hell did this come from? Apparently, past me had written a script and put it in my path to actually do exactly this. So it's like, past me is brilliant, current me is stupid. Um, so this is what tokens look like. So basically, tokens are typically consist of two things. A name, uh, which identifies the token. Internally, they're numbers, but they're just a, a constant that identifies the token, and then a value for it. Some of them, for example, are curly braces, uh, parentheses, quotes. Um, anything that's basically a single character doesn't have a token associated with it because it would be larger than the character itself. Um, so looking at this code, we can see we have an open tag. We have our class. We have some white space. We'll see a lot of that. String, which is our um, identifier of greeting. We open up the class with our curly brace. And um, is anyone having problems reading this? It's, it's quite simple. Um, there is some interesting stuff in here, though. Um, we'll look at here. Um, there's a difference between interpolated and non-interpolated strings. So if we look back, we have hello dollar two, and then we have world, which is just a straight string. Um, so they're both double quoted, and I did this on purpose. So a lot of people say, oh, you should use single quotes if you're not putting variables in it because it's faster. And it's generally not because of this. So basically, if there's no variables, we end up with this T constant escaped string, and that's just our value. Whereas if there's variables in it, we have our four tokens here, the two quotes, and then uh, our straight string and our variable. Um, <coughs> you can start to see why tokens can sort of matter for performance. Like looking at them can kind of give you some insight into what's going on under the hood. Um, but don't get caught up in micro-optimizations, which is pretty much what this talk is about. So there's four ways that I know of to create strings. Uh, the first one is double-quoted with no variables, single-quoted, obviously no variables. And as you can see, they're identical at this point. If we add in a variable, we go up to our four tokens. Interestingly, if we go with this syntax, which you'll often use for arrays or something inside of strings, um, we add even more tokens. Um, so I said that all single characters, are not, they don't have a token. This is the one uh, exception that I've seen. And this was to do with, it's kind of a, it's actually, it's a screw up. It was something that was added for PHP 6 for string access, character access. Um, and they removed it and left that in. So you can pretty much ignore it. But as you can see, PHP can do a lot of different things with the same sort of code. Any questions on tokens? Okay. So moving on from tokens, we get to opcodes. And this is kind of where PHP actually does a lot of its work. And if we're looking at opcodes, it means we're going to look at VLD, which is the Vulkan Logic Dumper, which was written by uh, Derek Rattans. He's speaking here as well. And VLD is an extension um, that will dump the compiled opcodes, the PHP sees, uh, to Peckle extension. So you can just uh, Peckle install VLD beta, because everything in Peckle is beta. Um, add the following to your PHP INI, and then you just activate it on the command line. Um, so dash D VLD dot active equals one will turn it on. And then uh, you can set execute to zero to not actually execute the code, just dump the opcodes. Um, and then VLD outputs four diff uh, three different things, sorry. Uh, it executes the global code. Uh, so it dumps the global code first. So anything that's in your main script, it will dump all the opcodes for that. Then it will dump the global functions, and then it will dump class functions. So looking at dumps, they can be quite complicated. Uh, they all start with a header, which tells you, in this case, what class you're in, what function you're in, what file that you're, you're uh, executing, and then the function again, for some reason. Tells you the number of ops, which is literally the number of opcodes that have been dumped. And it also tells you the compiled variables. And this line is incredibly important. I'll tell you why in a little bit. Under that, we then actually have our dump of opcodes. 
So it's a table um, with a bunch of columns on. So the first one is the line number in the source file, the opcode number, which is just a one through whatever list. We have this star column, which is terrible, but basically it's the entry and exit points. So when you enter into a function, there'll be a uh, left aligned um, greater than symbol. And when you exit, so when you return, there is a uh, left, uh, right aligned, sorry, greater than symbol. The opcode name, so those, um, so it'd be like Zend, uh, add, Zend, whatever, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, fetching, so basically any time uh, a super global is accessed, um, there'll be information in that column. The ext uh, column is used, it's just kind of a place to do stuff that's specific to an opcode. There's no actual definitive purpose for it. So for example, uh, for jumps, it'll tell you where to jump to. There are other uses for it. Um, any return data, and then uh, the operands used by any opcode. So if you've got, for example, uh, plus, um, you'll have the either side of that in that uh, column. There are four types of variables, um, and this is really important. So exclamation point prefixed ones are called compiled variables, and basically those are pointers to user land variables. So if we go back to here, this line here, basically tells you that number, like uh, exclamation point zero is $2 in user land. So that's how you can track what your user land variables are doing. Uh, tilde prefixed ones, they're temporary variables. So whenever you do something in PHP that needs to store something temporarily under the hood, they'll go into temporary variables. Uh, unless uh, it's something that needs to have ref counting, which we'll get into, uh, then it has a dollar prefix. Uh, and then the last one is colon prefixed, which they're used for one thing only, which is when um, the engine looks up a class in the hash table, uh, it stores it in colon prefixed ones. Um, I would like to say there is nothing that will syntax highlight this stuff, so I did it all by hand. Um, so looking at the first part of our code, so I'm actually doing this a little backwards because I think it's easier to understand this way. Um, so we're going to look at our class uh, function call first. Um, so we're in class greeting, function say hello, we've got one compiled variable, exclamation point zero, which points to dollar $2. Uh, and then this is what it's actually doing when it executes say hello. So the first thing we do is we receive an argument, which you'll see is exclamation point zero. So that's dollar $2 being passed in. We um, add a string. So what we're doing here, we're creating a temporary variable. We're assigning the first part of our um, echo to it, which is hello. Then we add a variable, so we're adding, we're basically concatenating um, our dollar two to our temporary variable, and then we echo out the temporary variable. Okay, um, and then lastly we return null because there's an implicit return. Any questions on that? Okay, one he needs to bring a mic. There's the man. Sorry. Hurry up. Uh, this guy here. Shouldn't there be an echo for the hello? I'm sorry, say again? Shouldn't there be an echo for hello? Uh, no, so because we have a temporary variable that contains the entire thing, this uh, tilde zero, that actually contains the entire string. Mm -hmm. So it, it first starts the, the temporary variable with hello, adds on the value of dollar two, and then echoes the whole deal. And that's what that says. I wish I'd have put that up earlier. Um, <laughs> so now we're going to look at the global code. So this is actually the code that calls that uh, method. So what's interesting for me here, there's five lines of code there and only two here, but this actually does a whole lot more. Um, so again, we've got our compiled variables, so our greeter, which is our object, exclamation point zero. Um, so the first thing that we do here, uh, except for the not, we'll ignore that, um, is we fetch the class. So we go and look up the greeting class in the uh, hash table, and we store it in colon one, so there's our uh, fancy variable, and then we instantiate it. So we have the new opcode. Um, so basically what we're doing here is we're instantiating uh, uh, an instance of colon one, greeting, and we're storing it in dollar two. So the reason it's dollar two is objects need ref counting, and like I said, I will get to that. I thought those slides were earlier. Like I said, these are old slides. Anyways, um, so we instantiate uh, our instance of the class, and then we actually call the constructor. 
So it's actually a two-part operation. So if anyone uses PDO and um, uses a fetch object, and you can assign a, a class that it'll create uh, the record uh, result set in, um, by default, it actually assigns all of the properties to their values from the columns before it calls the constructor. And you actually have to um, tell it to do it after the constructor. There's, a, there's an argument to do that. And the reason they can do that is because of this two-step process of instantiating an object. Next, we assign our uh, object in $2 to our first compiled variable, so our exclamation point zero. So that's basically this equals. And then we start calling our method. So method calls are, again, a multi-step process. So we initialize our method call. So we're going to use our greeter variable with the say hello method. We send in a value. So basically, we have a receive on the inside of the function that takes the argument. And we have a send val that passes the arguments in. And then we actually call the method. So we initialize it, send in values, and then we actually execute the method. And then finally, we return one because there's an implicit return of one uh, in global code. Any questions so far? Hmm. All right. So talking a little bit more about variables, because let's be honest, PHP is all about variables. If you don't have variables, it's a really shit language. Um, so under the hood, I said if I could wake this guy up, I'd be a good talk, and he's fallen asleep. Um, under the hood, we use things called zvals, or Zen values. These are a C data structure. Uh, they used to st store all PHP variable data. Doesn't matter what type. Um, and they're probably the most important thing in PHP, because as I said, PHP is a really shit language without variables. So what does this look like? So it's a struct called zval struct. We have four properties. Um, value, which stores the actual data. Uh, ref count GC, which is for the number of references to the zval, uh, the data type, and then um, whether the variable is a reference. Um, and then in that value uh, property, we have what's called a uh, zend value or a zval value. And this is a C union that actually stores the data. Uh, does anyone know what a union is? because I just learned this for the talk. OK, so a union is a data structure that is each, it, you can only store something in one of the properties. Um, and what's interesting about it is that it has the size of the largest member. So basically, this stores the actual data, and it's strongly typed. So when people say that PHP is not strongly typed, under the hood it actually is. And what's interesting is I tried, I tried so hard to actually change the type of a zval from userland, and it's basically impossible. Um, if you call uh, cast, uh, there's a function to actually change a variable to another type. It actually creates a, a, another zval under the hood. Um, the only way to change a zval's type is with internals code, C code. Um, it just switches out zvals otherwise. So in this uh, value union, we have longs for integers, doubles for floats. Strings are represented by another struct, which has the uh, value and the length. Um, and then we have two uh, special ones. Hash table is for arrays, and zend object value obj is for object handles. Um, so as I said, it is strongly typed uh, at the C level. Um, PHP coerces the data automatically for things like comparisons. So what will happen is when you do a comparison, it'll check the type in this structure and then coerce it uh, based on that. Um, so it never actually changes the dval type. There are nine types of data that get stored in one, two, three, four, five places. Um, nulls don't get stored. They're just null. Um, as I said, integers go into longs. Floats go into uh, dval. Strings go into that structure. Arrays go into ht and objects into objects. Now, what's interesting is Booleans and resources, there's a typo, damn it. Um, they go into the LVAL because basically they're numbers, 0 or 1 for Booleans or the resource um, identifier. The reason for that actually is memory saving. As I said, the structure is as large as its largest member. 
So adding like a Boolean type uh, extra member just for Booleans doesn't save you any memory. Um, so they just reuse the uh, long location. And then the type uh, property in the zval is set to one of those constants. Uh, so references and copy on write. Um, so PHP has something that I think is amazing. Um, to avoid copying data when you pass variables around, it uses something called copy on write, and it does this by doing something called reference counting. Um, so when you assign one variable to another, it's actually always a reference under the hood until the data changes. Um, but this is different from PHP references, the ampersand, um, but it's easier to show with examples. So. Uh, I stole this from the internals book, and the guy over there that wrote it is, is here. So uh, create a variable $A. We create a zval1 that goes along with that. Value of 1, ref counts of 1. We assign it to another variable B. And what we actually do, rather than create a copy, even though it's not a reference, we just increment the ref count. We assign B to C. We increment it again. So internally, they're all using one piece of memory because none of them are changing the value. As soon as you update any one of these, it then dereferences under the hood. And it's smart, because even though the original zval was $A, when we increment $A, that's the only one that gets a new zval. It doesn't do something stupid by saying, this was the first one, so we'll move all the others. Um, it only changes the one that you're changing. So what ends up happening is uh, B and C still point to zval1, the ref count gets decremented now to two, and we create a new zval, which is representing $A with a ref count of one. Um, this is great memory savings and such what. Um, if we then unset one of them, in this case B, we just decrement the ref count. So unsetting stuff doesn't necessarily save you memory. Uh, if we then unset C, which is everything that pointed to the first zval, that zval is finally destroyed. Um, so unset can help you in the long run, um, but if you've got some sort of weird references that you're not cleaning up, it's not really getting you anything. Um, and of course, A is still CVAL2. If we actually use references, so anyone have a question on that? Okay, if we actually use PHP references, what ends up happening is uh, we have the same thing with the ZVALs and the ref counts, but there's another property called isRef, um, and basically what that means is that when you start doing things like incrementing, it stops it from creating copies. It continues to update the original, so that's why everyone updates. That's how the references work. Um, so it checks is ref is zero or one. If it's a zero, it creates a copy for the one being modified. If it's a one, it does it in place, and everything that's pointing to it then is updated. Okay. Um, this one's interesting because it combines the two. A equals one, zval one, ref count one is ref zero. We haven't created any references yet. Uh, B equals A, ref count two, still no references. C equals B. So this is the same as our first example. Ref count three is ref zero. Now, if we create a reference, again, PHP is quite smart about this. It'll create two zvals, not three or four. Um, the ones that are not referenced go on the first one, and then it creates a second one just for the two that are referenced to each other. Um, so D is a reference of C, but not of A or B. Uh, so the Z, wow, that's not a wall. Um, the Z val needs to be copied here. Um, so basically we have two copies of the same Z val in terms of content, except that one is isRef0 and one is isRef1. Uh, if we then increment uh, D, um, they stay in place because those are referenced. Um, and the original one never gets changed. Um, so I will say uh, there's a talk later by Julian who's in here on the op cache. There may be a little bit of overlap, but his is much more in depth on it. Um, so optimizing op codes, um, this is something that Zend Optimizer or Zend op cache, as it's called, will do. Uh, incrementing by one is more than one way to do it because it's PHP. Well, most languages, really. Um, the first one, i equals 1, i plus plus. So we're going to post increment. Uh, the first thing that we do, sorry, before I go into this, any questions on the, OK. 
the first thing we do is we assign our value of one to our first compiled variable. And then we do what's called a post increment. So we increment the CV, the compiled variable, not, uh, not, exclamation point zero, and we store it in our temporary variable, tilde one. And then we immediately free it because we've not used it. This is why it's an optimization. If you pre-increment, then all we do is we assign and we increment it in place. We don't create a temporary variable. This is one of those tiny micro-optimizations that don't matter, but it's really interesting to know. Um, Zend Opcache will do this optimization for you. If there's no assignment, it'll actually, under the hood, switch them. Um, <coughs> Uh, so i equals 1, i equals i plus 1. Um, we assign our 1 to our first compiled variable. We add 1 to the, uh, the compiled variable and assign it to a temporary. And then we, uh, that's it, uh, we assign the temporary to back to the variable itself. This is why in some languages you can't um, assign a variable back to itself because it's modifying itself, right? the way PHP gets around that, is it creates a temporary variable for the right-hand side of the operand, stores that, and then assigns it back to the variable that it started out with. Plus equals one. Um, so this is kind of a shortcut. These, these operators are, are probably the best way to go about. Um, I, I always use plus equals one, not because it's a performance thing, but I always assume at some point I'm going to go back and say I need it to be more than one. Um, so I hate post and pre-increment. Um, so basically, we assign one to our compiled variable, and then we do an assign add, which is an in-place addition of whatever the right operand is, in this case, one. Any questions on those? Okay. So back to strings, um, quoting of strings. We're going to just do an echo of single quotes. And it literally is just echo the string. Same thing for double quotes. Now we get a bit complicated. So simple interpolation. Uh, we have one compiled variable, dollar $a. We assign the value, which is foo in this case, to our compiled variable. We create a temporary variable, uh, uh, tilde 1, and we assign our uh, compiled variable to it. We add a string, so this is very similar to our um, hello world from earlier. Uh, we add the rest of the string to the temporary variable, and then we echo out the temporary variable. Complex interpolation, so you remember if um, looking at the tokens, this created a whole bunch more tokens for the curly braces. Um, <clears throat> on the opcode level, they're actually identical. Um, I found that interesting. Concatenation. Uh, any questions on? Um, so simple concatenation. So a equals foo, a equals a dot bar. One compiled variable, a. Uh, we assign the value of foo to a. Then we use the concat opcode. Uh, we concat uh, the two, the compiled variable and bar, and we assign it to a temporary variable. Then we assign that back to our compiled variable. That's the right hand versus the left hand of the uh, equal sign. And then we have the implicit return. But we also have assigned concat. And as I said, these double sort of um, operators are the best. So we assign uh, foo to our compiled variable. And then we do an in-place concatenation. There's no temporary variable created by dot equals. I, sorry, I just want to say, if you do performance tweaking based on this talk, again, you're in trouble. Please don't. Um, so we already talked a little bit about method calls, uh, function calls, but I do want to go into it a bit more. Um, so calling something like PHP info with no arguments, it's a single call, do f call. Um, as soon as you start adding arguments, for example, bc add, we have the send values, which is passing in parameters and the do f call to actually call it. Um, there's no init here because it's not a, it's a straight uh, function, it's not a, a class uh, method. Um, <clears throat> so we basically queue up the two arguments to send in, uh, and then we actually do the function call with those two arguments. Um, 
I then created the same function, basically BC add, but without all the specialness, um, in uh, user land. So basically, pass in two arguments and it'll add them together. It's not very complicated. Um, looking at this on the user land side, we can actually see that it's identical. So send in two values, do the F call. But in this case, we can actually look at the other side. Um, so as I said, for every um, send val, on the opposite side, we have a receive. Um, so we receive two arguments. We assign them to 0 and 1, our compiled variables at the top here. We uh, add the two variables and assign them to a temporary variable, tilde 0. We then assign that to our third compiled variable, C. I wish I had the code up here. Um, uh, and then finally, we return our third compiled variable. So what this code looks like is function add two arguments uh, of A and B, um, C equals A plus B. Return it. Um, method overloading. Any questions before I get onto this one? Sorry, what? Oh, hang on. Mike. In the previous slide, yes. why were there two returns? Two, two sends? Oh, two receives. Return. Oh, OK. Um, there's always an implicit return in case this one is sort of inside of a conditional. Right, OK. So even if it doesn't need it, it puts it in there. Yes, it's still there. Now, Zendop cache may take that out. I don't, Julian, do you know if it does? Yes, okay. Um, OK, so method overloading. Um, so double underscore call. This now starts to get complicated. Um, the first thing, okay, so we've got class foo, public function bar, uh, public function double underscore call. So two uh, variables go into that. Uh, we instantiate foo, we call bar which exists, and we call bat which doesn't. So it'll go through double underscore call. So the first thing that we do is we look up the class, so foo, and we assign it to our colon one temporary variable. We instantiate it with the new, and we assign it to our, compiled, uh, to our special dollar sign prefixed uh, temporary variable. So we need ref counting because it's an object. <coughs> Sorry. We do f call by name, so we, recall, we call the constructor. It'd be great if I had some water. Uh, and then we assign the instantiated object in dollar two to our compiled variable, exclamation point zero. Then we call, we start calling the method. So as I said, now that we're inside of a class, we've got this init type process. Um, so we start calling a method um, called bar, and we execute it. Then we start calling a method called bat, and we execute it. Anyone notice anything interesting about this? Hmm? Exist. Yes. So, on the opcode level, there's actually no difference between hitting bar and hitting double underscore call. It all happens actually internally in the C level code. So, this um, do f call by name actually decides whether it's going to go through double underscore call or not. So, you can't actually tell some parts of your slowdowns just by looking at the opcodes. wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> Got to say. Um, any questions? <laughs> Hi, why is there always a, a knob at the start? I actually don't know the answer to that, and I asked someone who should, and they don't know either. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Zendop cache will kind of remove extra knops. Um, Zendop cache will also do things like if there's a jump that skips other jumps and other things like that, it'll just get rid of branches it can't reach. Um, but yeah, uh, when I first did the, uh, all the slides for this, I had um, xdebug turned on, um, and that injected a whole bunch of extra opcodes. And uh, Sarah Goldman went, what are those doing in there? Jaff xdebug? And I went, yes. She goes, you need to turn it off and redo all your slides. <laughs> and of course, with the custom syntax highlighting, a lot of fun. Any other questions? Or do you have more? Thank you. Anyone else? Oh. Um, you sort of gave a disclaimer through a lot of the talk about don't bother optimizing this. 
Yes. Um, are there any worthwhile gains to be made through optimization by understanding internals? Um, I definitely feel like having... Did everyone hear the question? Okay. Um, I definitely feel that understanding this stuff makes you a better programmer, which is why I decided to give this talk. Um, I wish I'd understood it probably five years ago, <clears throat> um, but practically not really, and that's why I dropped the performance out of the title. So, anyone else? Oh shit, it's Nate. No, no, this isn't a scary one. I actually just wanted to know how copy on write works across function calls, like when you're passing parameters and things like that. Um, the same way. The Zvals, uh, it's just passing references to the Zvals. Okay, so under the hood, it's just one global list of Zvals, in other words? Yes. Gotcha. Thanks. Anyone else? Please? <laughs> Got a lot of time left. All right, so... If you have any feedback, joined in, um, or Twitter, prefer joined in, um, email davidenginyard.com, and the slides will be up at davidshaffit.com slash slides. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>